Jesus is still alive. He was, uh, the disciples were surprised by this, that they could encounter him face to face. And it's hard for us to believe that just as Jesus walked the earth after his, 50 day, uh, after his three days in the ground, he is still alive today. And what Jesus did for his disciples then, he is still willing to do for us today because he's still alive. In today's scripture, we see that one thing he was willing to do was have a hard conversation with Peter. We're not going to talk about necessarily hard conversations today, but what we're going to see is that the, the problem with Peter was that he got stuck thinking about himself, and it didn't work out. In fact, it led to probably the greatest grief of Peter's entire life when he denied Jesus. And what Jesus does, that he still does for us today, is he comes to Peter and invites him to think of something greater than himself. He invites him to pay attention to something greater than himself. He invites Peter to live in greener pastures than those that he can find in his own little self-enclosed world. And he's going to, Jesus is going to make the same invitation to us to look outside of ourselves into the greener pastures of who he is. So as we encounter the scriptures, let's first pray. Lord God, we do pray that as your word speaks to us today, we would be called away from ourselves and that our gaze would be fixed on you so that we can see what is more wonderful than we could ever see in ourselves or in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. So after his resurrection, Jesus came to the disciples. He made a few appearances, and in this particular one, he did this famous thing where he's on the sh they're, they're out fishing early in the morning, and he's on the shore, and they're not catching any fish, and he said, put it over on the other side. And they say, oh, okay, fine. They put the net on the other side and they pull it in and they can't even pull it in. There's so many fish suddenly. So, such an abundant catch of fish. And then, but a, a less appreciated aspect of that story is this whole time, Jesus is on shore cooking them breakfast, which is just a nice gesture. So then as they come ashore and they're happy to see him, they hug him, and he also made them a nice breakfast. And so they eat and they talk and they're together. And then after they eat, Jesus gets down to business. This is John 21, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Because it's time for Jesus and Peter to have a very tough conversation. Peter had denied knowing Jesus before Jesus died. In John 18, Jesus is he's being taken in for trial, and the authorities are trying to put him to death, and Peter's kind of following behind quietly, and he's waiting outside the courtroom, keeping a low profile, when someone asks him, are you one of Jesus' disciples? And Peter says, I am not. So in the moment of truth, Peter had to make a choice. Am I loyal to Jesus or do I save my own skin and forsake him? And we have to be careful that we're not too hard on Peter because frankly we would quite possibly have done the same thing. Remember that Jesus is being led away to trial and it's not like a trial in America where you're basically guaranteed a pretty fair trial and if you are going to be killed as a result of your trial, it's going to take years and years. There's all sorts of justice and laws and protections, and that doesn't, wasn't necessarily the case. So they're leading Jesus away, and they're going to kill him, and it could be a pretty quick turnaround before Jesus is killed. And anybody associated with him could also be killed. Why not? He was dangerous as far as they were concerned. And so... Anyone associated with him was suspect to the authorities and in danger. So Peter is just trying to lay low and keep out of sight when someone recognizes him and says, hey, 
You were with Jesus, weren't you? So if Peter gives himself away, what will probably happen is the police, which by the way, John 18 makes it very clear that the police are in the courtyard with Peter. That the police are there. They were the ones who made the fire and they're warming themselves. That the police will come over, summarily arrest him, lead him to trial, and he will, in all likelihood, be killed or tortured or something too. So he makes that denial. Right? He's looking over at the police. He weighs his options. He says, what am I going to do? And he says, no. He makes his choice. It's a very stressful situation. We can, I don't want to uh, let us think that Peter just casually chose to, betray, to deny Jesus. It's stressful. He's on edge. He, he's looking around. He's scared. And he did what human beings tend to do in a situation like that, in a scary or a difficult or a stressful situation. Narrow his focus until it's just himself and close down the outside world. That's what human beings do when we experience stress. We go into self-protection mode, and our, our sphere of concern, our view of the world, which is normally, you know, about this big, narrows as we get more and more anxious and more and more stressed or, or afraid until eventually our sphere of concern, what we're looking at, the factors that we're considering, are just us. And it, it gets smaller and smaller until it's just us. And that's what happened to Peter. His view of things, narrowed. so at first he, got, he went into that situation with his, his worldview was about this big. And he was saying, I will never forsake my God. I believe in Jesus. He is my Messiah. I will stand for my principles and I will stick with my friend. And then it got more and more stressful and his thing narrowed and narrowed and narrowed until what he was saying was, I don't know him, just don't kill me. He got all the way to just self-preservation. He, he just suddenly became all about Himself. Will I die or will I not? Got to make sure I don't. And you don't have to be in a life-threatening situation to become absorbed in yourself. That's one of the chief results of sin. Because we're sinful human beings, it's very easy and fast to get absorbed in yourself. And if, if you don't believe me, just, th just consider this. When, when you're running late, you turn into a sociopath, right? So normally when we're, not, when we're right on time, we're five minutes early and we're driving down the road, it's what a lovely day, hello officer, nice to see you out doing your job, I'm gonna tell them to full stop at this stop sign, feel the rollback and go because it's a great day and I am so happy and I just love being a law-abiding, civic-minded person. And then as soon as you're running late, the police have got to leave, right? Everybody's got to get out of your way. Everybody around you is stupid. All of their behavior is stupid. Have you noticed that? And traffic laws are suggestions. Not even suggestions. They're, they're uh, impedances. Because suddenly when we're under stress, not even that much stress. We're late. We're five minutes late. People aren't even going to care. But our sphere of concern goes from being civic-minded and law and society-oriented and other-oriented to being me. How do I get me to that place? And everything else that affects other people just like melts away. And we become totally self-focused. It doesn't take much to get us to that point. And so lest we judge Peter, I mean, come on. It doesn't take much. And it can happen short term, of course, like if you're late or if your life is threatened. But it can also happen over the long term because life is hard and stressful. And life throws threats at you. And life makes you anxious. And so you can spend actually long periods of time sort of driven into yourself. Sort of compressed so that you, all you see is this. And you're thinking only about your own needs, about how hard it is to be you, pitying yourself, or just doing your own thing, doing whatever you like, whatever you want. And sometimes we even think that we're happy, acting like the world doesn't really go much farther than the two feet around our head. And the reality is that we're not happy. Being absorbed in ourselves is not joyful. Who's happy when they're rushing through traffic to get somewhere when they're late? Nobody. 
We end up doing things that we regret, saying things that we regret, letting relationships slide, right? Feeling angry and bitter and wasting a lot of time. And of course, the first person that we forget, before we forget any human being, the first person we forget is God. God is the first one to go when we start narrowing our view of the world. Prayer is the first thing to stop. Now, I, I do want to be clear that when I talk about being self-absorbed, I'm not talking about being arrogant, necessarily. So when Peter denied Jesus, when they came down and they said, weren't you with him? It's not the case that Peter said, you know, was I with him with that chump? No, I'm way too good for him. That's not what he did. He said, you know, he kind of shyly looked down and closed his eyes and said, nope, nope, don't know him, nope, don't know him. He wasn't bragging, but he was totally self-absorbed. He was absorbed in how threatened he felt and how to save himself. So, you know, it's possible to be self-absorbed by thinking about how great we are, but it's, it's also possible to be self-absorbed because all we can think about is how terrible we are and how weak we are, and how unsatisfied we are with ourselves. That's self-absorption too. Or all we can think about is how hard things are. And that's no, it's not life-giving. It's, it's a dark place to be. But the common thread through all those things, whether it's arrogance, or self-hatred, or self-pity, is self. We are paying attention primarily to ourselves. And we're not at our best. I just want to give you, you know, an example. Is usually when, because I, I've been there, I can be honest about that. And what happens is we find that we have plenty of time to, to watch TV. We have plenty of time to go on Facebook. We have plenty of time to do little projects that need to be done. Lots of time, plenty of time maybe to go to work and do whatever we think is important and necessary. But for some reason we have no time for prayer and no time for our friends and family. That's how you know that your world is starting to shrink and you're becoming self-absorbed. You've got plenty of time for things that you do alone or things that benefit you or things that you think are important and you just find that relationships, first God, second people, are slipping. And being absorbed in ourselves like that happens and is not a good place to be. In fact, if you look at Luke twenty-two sixty-two, this is after Peter denied Jesus, it's not like he breathed a sigh of relief, right, and said, nope, I don't know him. And they said, okay, and then he said, whew, that was close. Now I get to live more. No, it's, it says that he went outside and wept bitterly. So, I mean, when life is hard, and it's always hard, we naturally lead ourselves into some form of isolation, we may not necessarily be alone, but we are lonely. And we can be surrounded by loved ones, but all of our thoughts are somehow coming back to us. We could even be surrounded by God's presence. We could be one wall between us and Jesus. We are following him for our whole lives, and suddenly all our thoughts are about us. Peter was there. Peter was totally there. That's why he denied Jesus. That was the root problem. And we get there so often. The question is, of course, how do we get out? How do we get out of the dark, lifeless, closed-in self-place and go to greener pasture where there's life and light? We need a good shepherd to lead us out. We're not going to get out on our own. And Jesus, of course, is that good shepherd. Look at what he says to Peter. Peter, who's in probably in the darkest place of his life now. He's denied Christ. He denied his best friend. And now he's seeing him face to face and having that conversation. He's never been more guilty. He's never felt worse. And Jesus says to Simon Peter three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter felt hurt because he said the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times. Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus gives him three chances to come out of that self-place. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. See what he's doing? He, he, he's shepherding Peter out of himself. So Peter had to, has shrunk all the way down into himself when he denied Jesus. All the way down into, I don't want to die. What do I have to do to save me? And Jesus is inviting him out and saying, why don't you think, do you love me? Why don't you think about loving me? Why don't you look at me? And if you can do that, why don't you look around you at my sheep and take care of them? He's just coaxing him out of that place and saying, look up. He said, get your attention away from Peter and put it on me. Put it on Jesus. Because paying attention to Jesus, being obsessed with Jesus, just looking at him only and only thinking about him is so much greener pasture than being absorbed in ourselves. Why? Because Jesus, Jesus is just better. He's just better than anything else. He's just so much more beautiful. Look at what Hebrews 1 verse 3 says. Jesus is the, the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. So Jesus is perfect grace, perfect love, perfect holiness, perfect power, perfect humility, perfect gentleness. You, can, you can't possibly direct your attention to anything better than Jesus. John 1 says Jesus is the light of the world. If you look at him, you see light, you see truth, you see life. So Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, stop looking at yourself. Look at me. If you keep looking at yourself, you're going to keep seeing your ugliness and your guilt and your shame. You're just going to keep seeing darkness. Look at me. You can see light. You can see beauty, grace, holiness. Just look at me. And you know, it, it almost sounds vain. It almost sounds vain that the whole point of God is to get us to pay attention to God. If you've ever met a person who you feel like their whole point of their existence is to get you to pay attention to them, that's not a person that you like. So it, it seems vain. How could, how could God's whole purpose, how could Christ's whole purpose be to get us to pay attention to him? But in reality, it's not vain. It's the, it's the kindest thing that he could do. I just want you to think about when you have been the most amazed, the most in awe, the most filled with joy. And I bet it has something to do with looking at the night sky, looking out at the ocean, watching kids play, sitting with your family, all of those things are taking you out of yourself. Right? You're looking at the night sky and you realize how small you are, but more importantly, how big the universe is. It takes you out of yourself. That's why it fills you with joy. That's why when you look at the ocean, it's, it's, it's so marvelous and you're so filled with wonder. It's because you're not looking at yourself. You're looking at something glorious. You're beholding God's glory. That's when we're happiest. That's when we're most joyful. Not when we're looking at ourselves, but when we're looking at something outside, big, huge, powerful, glorious and beautiful. So uh, for God to invite us to say, hey, look at me, is not vain. He's saying, look, trust me, look at me, you'll be so much happier. Because God is the best thing. Jesus comes to us and invites us outside of our little dark closed off holes. It says, behold God. Come to the greener pasture. Come to somebody who can give you so much. And all of Jesus' words were designed to shepherd Peter out, to coax him out, to, to let him lift up his eyes and open them. That's, des that's Jesus' desire for all of us, for all of his sheep to lead us into the greener pasture of his presence where we can find everything that we could not find in ourselves. So Caitlin and I walked in the park yesterday, Onondaga Lake Park, 
and we're, go, we're walking along, and we see this family with young kids. One of the kids is, he's like, just starting to get okay at walking. He's like that age, I guess like three, four. And if you know anything about child development, you know that kids have the smallest and most, young kids especially, have the smallest and most self-centered worldview of anybody. There's only one person in the world of a kid, me, right? Mine is the first word that they learn, and then give me is the second word that they learn. That's how kids, it's just how kids work. It's not their fault. Kids are very self-oriented. And that doesn't work very well for them because one of the things that you notice is you see a kid who just learned how to walk, and this is what was happening. He's shuffling along, and then he falls. Now, the kid's like two feet tall. He weighs like four pounds. It, it's not a big fall, right? But he falls, and, and then he gets up, and, the, and what does he do? He cries. He cries. He's not hurt. There's no blood. It's not even that he's not bleeding. He's not hurt. He like, there's nothing wrong. And yet he cries because his world is so small that he only knows one thing. I fell, therefore I must cry. Now those of you, people out there have had kids. You know that's how it works. Kids cry, little kids, even if nothing is wrong. And you have to say to them, and this is what the dad was saying, don't cry, you're okay, you're not hurt, everything is fine, don't cry, don't cry, you're fine. The kid did not want to hear it. Because the kid's world is this big, and his world is full of one fact. I fell. Then the, so then the dad got wise. He said, don't cry, don't cry, don't, you're, you're okay, okay. And then he said this, look at me. And the kid turned and looked at him. And it was like a light switch went off. Because, because then he said, you're okay. The kid said, oh yeah, right, 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 right. I'm, working, I'm four years old, I'm three years old, I'm working on this, I don't understand it yet, but there is a world outside of myself. And when the dad said, look at me, he turned and looked. He's like, right, there's a big world where there's a big, strong dad who loves me and everything is okay. There's a world beyond the world in which I just fell. Right? The, but the thing that the dad had to do was say, look at me. To, so the kid would rip his attention out of his tiny little world and blow it up and say, gosh, there's a huge world out there. We're at a park. We're walking. My dad's here. Ah. Oh. And then he had peace. That dad figured it out. It wasn't that hard. But that kid needed someone greater than him to say, get out of yourself and look at me. That's exactly what Jesus did for Peter, and it's exactly what he wants to do for all of us. He wants to shepherd us out of ourselves. Let us say, look at me, open your eyes, look around and lead us where we can find something bigger. We'll, we'll find so much more than the little world that we collapse into. And Jesus is so passionate about that. He's so passionate about shepherding us outside of ourselves to let us see him that he would even die in order to do that. He died to make that possible. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15 says this about Jesus Christ. He died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for their sake and was raised. So Jesus Christ died on a cross to give us something to live for outside of ourselves. Because left to our own devices, we would just collapse every time. We would live for ourselves, just like Peter. We would see what's best to preserve me. What do I think is valuable? How do I get what I think is valuable? How do I accrue achievements for myself? What are my achievements? How do I find what is satisfying to me? Those are the questions we would ask. And he's given us something better, something better to live for. We can live for him. We can lift up our heads and see God. See beauty, truth, light, mercy, power, satisfaction, holiness, perfection, greener pastures for our souls. They're not in here. They're out there where God is. So what do we do? What do we do? Let's take a look at what Jesus has Peter do. He says this in verse 18. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. 
But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. So basically what he says to Peter is this. Peter, you used to decide for yourself what was important, what you were going to do, what was valuable, what was good, and what was bad. And now, someone else is going to decide that for you. And that person is me. Let me show you how to live. Let me show you what is important. Let me, Jesus Christ, show you what is beautiful. And I will show you to the greener pasture that you're looking for. Let me lead you rather than leading yourself. That is a very hard message in American culture because our culture loves the self. And there's nothing wrong with the self per se, right? But our culture loves to say, well, if you just look deep inside yourself, you'll find your truth and you'll live it out. And that sounds great, but it's so lonely. And our culture says, well, you just got to figure out what your strengths are and what's going to make you happy, and that's what you have to do. And our culture says, you know, you can do it all alone. And the, the person we love is the Lone Ranger because he does it all alone. We love, we love it when people do it alone because that's awesome. And they're just, they know themselves and they're confident and then that's what success and joy is. But it's so wrong, it's so lonely and it's so dark and small. And Jesus says there doesn't have to be that way. Come out, come out into the light. Come out and look at something so amazing. Look at me. So let Jesus Christ lead you. Let him decide. Let him be the one who ties the belt around your waist and stretch out your hands to him and let him be the one who leads you where he wants you to go. And he will not lead you anywhere bad. It might hurt, but he will not lead you anywhere except to his own presence. He'll lead you to the greenest pastures in all of creation. The pasture of his presence. And I promise you, your cup will overflow Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life and you will dwell in his house forever. Let him lead you outside of yourself to him. Glory to God. Amen. Let's stand. And if you desire to let Jesus Christ lead you away from yourself and into his presence, his glorious life-giving presence, then we will proclaim our faith in him together in the words of the Nicene Creed. And if that's not you today, I just encourage you to meditate on who Christ is and what he offers. Now let the redeemed of the Lord say together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things seen and unseen, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.